Okay, uh, welcome to lecture here. We are starting uh, ch chapter 15, I think, since we finished up all the titration stuff last time. Okay, so uh, last time, like I said, uh, we pretty much finished up chapter 14, which had a lot of stuff in there. Um, everything from assets and bases to buffers to titrations. So again, a lot of stuff happening in that chapter. Uh, we are having a quiz a little bit later on, on the first part of that chapter. Um, and we'll take it at the start of lab. And then uh, we'll talk about lab afterwards. But um, yeah, a lot of stuff in there. So make sure again, that you stay on top of it. As I mentioned before, we are in the kind of midst of the hardest part of this class for a lot of people. And again, it's a lot of calculations. There's a lot of understanding what's going on uh, during those processes. But as we talked about last time, you know, sort of the good news is a lot of what we were talking about in terms of titrations, uh, they're all sort of calculations that you've sort of done before or seen before. Uh, the key is just to make sure that you can apply it correctly to the right situation. And that's the sort of important part when you're kind of going through it. So, uh, into uh, chapter 15, again, the notes should be up there on uh, Canvas if you need them. Um, and here we're gonna kind of switch gears, not too much, uh, kind of similar to what we've been talking about, but we're gonna talk about KSP, uh, which is the solubility product, and KF, which is the formation constant. So we're gonna talk really about equilibrium that involves um, in this chapter here, equilibrium that involves solubility and complex ions. So sort of a continuation of our sort of talk on uh, equilibrium and we're gonna hit into some solubility type of things. Uh, you may wanna to refer to uh, or refresh yourself on some solubility rules if you're not 100% on those uh, from Chem 50. Um, to be truthfully honest with you, you probably even most part can figure out most of what you need uh, based on the problem and what's sort of given to you. Um, <clears throat> but it would probably not hurt too much to sort of review some of those solubility rules um, so that you have a pretty good understanding of what you would expect to be sort of soluble or insoluble. So let us start then with KSP. And KSP does stand for the solubility product. Um, and that's what the SP stands for. It is also really just an equilibrium constant like every other equilibrium constant. So if we take something like silver chloride, for example, and based on solubility rules, if you remember chlorides, bromides, iodides, they are soluble in everything except for silver, lead two, and mercury one. And in this case, since we do have silver with the chloride, it would be a solid. And it will set up an equilibrium. So this is also something that sometimes people uh, have a hard time understanding in terms of solubility. So let's just talk a little bit about that. Sometimes when we take something like uh, Chem 50 or something like that, and you learn the solubility rules and all that, you tend to have the opinion that based on solubility rules, it says that this particular substance will be insoluble. And it is true, it is going to be insoluble. And for the most part, it's going to be a solid. But even things that are technically insoluble has some degree of solubility. So um, there's a lot of, of factors that affect solubility. Uh, and we'll talk about a lot of them here in this chapter, things like pH, um, things like concentration. Uh, these are all things that can affect the actual solubility of a, of a product, for example. Um, but just because we kind of envision something as being insoluble in this solid based on solubility rules, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is no solubility at all. It may just be super, super small, the amount that will come apart, but it can still come about, uh, apart. So everything has some degree of solubility, regardless of sort of the solubility rules, even if it says it's insoluble, you know, it, it's going to be soluble to a degree. And there's a lot of factors, as I said, that does affect that. So although we do think of silver chloride as being a solid, it will still basically set up this equilibrium because it does have some degree of solubility. 
and it will break apart into its ions of silver ion and chloride ion. And basically we will get this equilibrium that will set up between the solid and our ions. And we can, because again, it is an equilibrium, we can write an equilibrium expression for it, just like everything else, which would be our products over our reactants. And in this particular case, our KSP, which again stands for solubility product, SP stands for, would be our products, which is our ions, divided by our reactants, which is our solid here. So there's like a normal equilibrium expression. We do not include solid. So this would be our equilibrium, our KSP expression for silver chloride. And again, that is our solubility product. Now, the way these things are set up or what you could kind of think of as for KSP, KSP are sort of the equilibrium constants for insoluble. sort of species. So KSP really deals with a lot of things that are insoluble and again their degree that which they would break apart. And that means that for the most part all KSP expressions are pretty much just the products because when we write a KSP reaction it is always solid to ions. So you never usually get anything on the reactant side in most situations. It's just the products because that's where our ions are. And it's always solids on the reactant side and aqueous ions on the product side. So KSP, again, sort of an equilibrium constant for things that are typically considered to be insoluble. So here's a few more examples. And we do, as you can see, everything that we normally do uh, with an equilibrium. So here again, you can see on the left-hand side or the reactant side, all the solids are written. And on the product side, we have all the aqueous ions that are written on this product side. So all of them are products. Again, no reactants because they're all solids. But we still do the same thing as we normally would do with an equilibrium. We get two fluorides. So we do square it, obviously. We get two silvers in this case. So we want to make sure we square it. We have three of the calciums and two of the phosphates. So just like normal, we use the coefficients as the exponents here to write our KSP sort of expression. Now, as we will see, because KSPs are essentially for things that are insoluble, and if things are insoluble, that means that they're going to be solid most of the time. And that would mean that the equilibrium most likely lies to the left here. And what we will see is in terms of KSP values, they are typically very small values. So they're usually very small values, these KSPs. And that does make sense. Again, since they are mostly insoluble stuff, we would expect that when it reaches equilibrium that we mainly have reactants, which are our product, which are our solid guys, and again, because of our small value of K, that should mean we have mainly reactants there. And those guys are our solids. Now we can decide whether or not that we would expect perhaps a, a solid to form if we mixed a couple of solutions together by looking at the KSP and also looking at something that we've seen previously as well, which is Q. And if you remember, Q is the reaction quotient and it is solved the same way as you would solve k so we could use q and the value of the ksp to help us decide if we expect a solid to form or not so for example if i want to calculate q here for the silver chloride again it is done just like you would calculate k and again, we use Q, if you remember, for situations where earlier on we weren't sure if we were at equilibrium. Um, and we can kind of use it to determine if we're at equilibrium. So here we can use Q in combination with the KSP to uh, determine whether or not we would expect, again, a solid to form. So usually this is used 
when you're trying to decide if you dump kind of two solutions together, you know, would you expect a solid uh, basically two form? So if we calculate Q and it is less than the KSP, that means that you have an unsaturated solution. So if you remember what an unsaturated solution means, it's a solution that has not reached the limit of where the solute will uh, dissolve. So that means that if you put more solid or something in there, it will continue to dissolve and it, you'll be fine. So you would expect no precipitate to form if you uh, calculate Q and it is less than the KSP value. Now, uh, you can always go opposite of where this points. So it's pointing to the left, so it would go to the right. And on the right-hand side here, you can see we have aqueous ions and we would get no precipitate. If uh, Q is equal to the KSP, then we would have a saturated solution. A saturated solution is pretty much the part where you've hit the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in a solvent. So you're right there, pretty much at the tip of, you're gonna get a solid pretty much, right? So you're at the maximum that will dissolve. If you put any more in there, you pretty much would expect a solid to form. And that's basically what a saturated solution is. A super saturated solution is something that we get when we have Q that is greater than the KSP value. So if you calculate Q and it's greater than the KSP value, again, going opposite of where it's pointing, would point you to the reactant side. And again, in the reactant side, in all these sort of KSP expressions, they're solids. So we would expect a solid to form. A supersaturated solution is a solution that technically has more solute dissolved than solvent than it should. And it typically is a very unstable sort of solution. And the solid really does want to kind of come out of solution at that point. So a famous experiment is kind of you make a saturated solution of something like uh, sodium acetate you heat it up a little bit you get a lot more solid to dissolve then you cool it back down solubility changes and it's a very unstable so unstable you could just knock it and all the solid will come out of solution so something else to keep in mind right is solubility is affected by temperature so typically if you increase the temperature you could get more solid to dissolve in a liquid and vice versa obviously if you decrease the temperature you could have less solid uh, dissolved in the solution. So here we can use Q and compare it to KSP to decide really in sort of our application here, if we mix a couple of solutions together, would we expect a solid to form or not form uh, based on sort of some factors that we will talk about here. <clears throat> Any questions on that so far? Here's a table from your book. And again, you may have to uh, look it up uh, some values here, here in your book and a table and stuff. But what we see is uh, these are all KSP values. And for the most part, if you look at uh, these values here, they're pretty small values. I mean, we got some to the, you know, minus 40, for example, over here. Um, you know, we got some minus 13s, some minus 11s, some minus 32s. So these are super sort of small values for K which again, in the most part of what we talk about solids on our reactant side and ions are aqueous on our product side. So because most of these are relatively small values, that means when we do reach equilibrium, we do mainly have solids present, which you know sort of follows our solubility rules that we think about things as being solid. But because it's an equilibrium, you may have a small amount of ions that are still present as well. So these are very small. And again, that's why we sort of think about KSP as being the equilibrium for things that are typically insoluble um, because they mainly stay together and mainly make a solid. But again, everything, even things that are technically insoluble has some degree of solubility associated with it. Here's some more, and again, you can see some even bigger numbers as you head this way, minus 41, you know, minus 40 something. You know, so these are very, very small numbers. Even the larger numbers are smaller ones. You know, you got to the minus seven and minus 11, minus 13. So again, very small values for KSP. And again, that's because they are mainly insoluble sort of substances. 
So we can use KSP uh, to figure out the solubility of, of these things. Uh, and when we talk about solubility, again, if something is soluble, that means that you know when they mix, they mix really well. There's no solid that's formed. You know, so if you took like a solid and a liquid and put it together, solid would dissolve. If you took two liquids and mixed them together, it would mix and just still be a, a solution at that point. Uh, if something's insoluble, you know, you would expect some type of solid to form. Uh, if you mix two solutions together, you expect a solid to form. Uh, if you took a solid and a liquid and it's insoluble, again, you can mix it all day. It won't really dissolve and that type of stuff. So when we talk about solubility, there's really two types of solubility that we deal with uh, for the most part. And one is the molar solubility. And the molar solubility really is just the molarity. As you can see here, molar solubility is moles per liter, which is really just our capital M here. And that is the number of moles of solute that you could dissolve in one liter of a saturated solution. And the other one is just regular solubility is sometimes referred to, and that is how many grams per liter. And pretty self-explanatory there, that's basically how many grams of solute you can dissolve in a liter of solution. So when we do these problems, there's sort of uh, two types of problems that you commonly come across. And it's really based on the information that's given to you. The first one is they give you the solubility of the compound. And again, that could be in grams per liter, could be in some other unit as well. You then typically want to convert it into molarity. And then you want to find the concentrations of the positive ion and the negative ion. And then you want to go into the KSP type of expression, your positive and your negative guy, and get a number. Right? So that's one approach to a problem, a very common problem. They give you the solubility. You need to relate the solubility to each of the ions. And you basically just plug and chug into the K expression. The opposite of that is they give you only the KSP value. So this is kind of like uh, given just the KSP or an equilibrium constant. Uh, typically, we uh, would then have to sort of take an ice table approach to this. Solve. And that would give you the molar solubility at that point. And from that, you can convert it to something like grams per liter or something like that. Now, the top one, technically speaking, in those type of problems like the top one, you don't necessarily have to do an ice table. It can help you, though, uh, you know, sort of work out the problem maybe correctly, um, but you don't necessarily have to do an ice table. The bottom one, when you're only given a K value, you pretty much need to do an ice table. Uh, so these are the two sort of common approaches here, uh, two sort of solubility problems. Uh, a lot of times it does involve an ice table and um, sort of figuring out the concentrations of the ions that are present. So let's take a look at one here together just to uh, sort of show you um, a way that you, we can do these problems. So I'm going to show you a way here and then um, I'm going to explain what you don't necessarily have to do in this case or you can do it this way. So in this case, we are given the uh, solubility of silver phosphate, and it is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. What is the KSP for silver phosphate? So first off, if we uh, take something like silver phosphate, it is going to break apart. So silver phosphate here. It will break apart into three silvers and one phosphate. That means that if we write our KSP here, our KSP would be the concentration of silver and we would need to cube it because of the three that's there times the concentration of phosphate and no Nothing needed there because the coefficient is one. And that is ultimately what we're trying to find here. Now, in this particular problem, you don't actually need to do an ice table, but I'm going to show you what the ice table looks like 
because it's slightly different than what we sort of normally do, especially when we're dealing with KSP. It's similar, but a little bit different. So let's take a look at what an ice table would look like. So initially, uh, in this particular case, we are not given anything. So it would be zero, zero. Again, nothing written here because this is solid. So it's not going to basically interact. The change here, now normally when we do changes, we use the letter X. And technically you could still use that X, but usually a lot of times what people will use in this type of situation is since we're talking about solubility, we oftentimes will use S instead of X. And S represents the molar solubility. or the molarity basically, right? So different than sort of a normalized table where we use X, and again, really you could use any letter you want, but a lot of people will use S. We're not again going to put anything here because it's solid, but this would then be plus three S plus S. Again, the three for the coefficient. And again, here the coefficient is one. So we do the exact same things we normally do with the X, but we just use S and the S represents the molar solubility. That means when we get to equilibrium, again, not worrying about this guy, that's gonna give us three S and S. Any questions on a sort of solubility ice table? Kind of very similar, except that typically we use S which represents molar solubility. Okay, and you know, if this was a different type of problem, we would typically go into our KSP, which is our silver cube and our phosphate, right? And normally this would equal the KSP value, but obviously we don't know what that is. So we're trying to find that. So we could still actually do that. We could take this and put it in, take this guy and put it in here. And what we end up getting is the KSP is equal to 3S cubed times S. And at this point, we actually know what S is. So in this particular problem, they gave us this, which is molarity, and that is S in this case. That is the molar solubility. So we basically can go right into our KSP expression three times 1.6 times 10 to the minus five cubed times uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus five. And if we do all that, grab a pen and a calculator here, uh, we end up uh, with, One point eight to the minus eighteen as the KSP value. That is a very small value. And again, this is for something that is pretty much insoluble. So this is sort of what an ice table will look like when you do an ice table. And sometimes it's a good idea to do the ice table. And I'll tell you why, because a lot of people will not maybe understand what they should do in, in the terms of, you know, they oftentimes will go, okay, I, I cubed it. I, do I still need to multiply it by three? So sometimes by doing it this sort of longer way, uh, it sometimes will help you maybe do the math right. So it's very common people sometimes think, well, I multiply it by three, I don't need to cube it as well, or I cubed it, I don't need to multiply it by three. And somewhere along the way, a lot of times people will miss, you know, one of these kind of things in the calculation part. So sometimes it's helpful to kind of do this. First off, any question on that? So what I, what I am saying that you don't necessarily have to do an ice table in a problem like this is if, uh, If we looked at that guy, which was uh, silver phosphate,
and we broke it apart like we normally do here and we did before and we had the whoops together one six to the minus five we know that the molarity of this guy was 1.6 times 10 to the minus five molar and if you understand molarity and how it works with ions like you probably covered in chem 50 it's a one to three relationship which means you multiply this by three and it's a one to one relationship here which means the concentration of this guy is 1.6 times 10 to the minus five and at that point you could go right into your ksp expression and if you have uh <clears throat> 4.8 times 10 to the minus 5 cubed times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 5. And then obviously you get the same answer. So if you understand sort of how concentrations work, you can, you know, go kind of right into the expression by understanding that you need to multiply the concentration by 3. And here it's a one-to-one -one relationship. You could go directly into here. It's essentially what we just did with the ice table. But if you understand sort of that relationship, you could go straight into here. That is usually the situation though, where some people will, you know, they may get this part, but they'll forget about this part, you know? So there's a lot of sometimes that problem uh, when people do this. So this type of problem, because we were given the solubility, we didn't technically need to do an ice table. You could have just got the concentrations of each of the ions and went into the KSP expression. Or if it's easier for you to visually sort of see it, you could just go through the ice table and then you'd know, okay, I need to multiply and sort of cube it as well. Any questions on that? Okay, so why don't you give one a try here. Uh, what is the solubility of silver chloride? And the KSP for silver chloride, we will use as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And let's do the solubility in grams per liter. So silver is, uh, what is that, 107.9. And chlorine is 35.45. All right, so I want you to take a couple of minutes here. We're looking for what is the solubility in grams per liter of silver chloride. Again, KSP of silver chloride, 1.6 to the minus 10. So see what you come up with.
Okay, so let's take a look. And uh, <clears throat> so again, this particular sort of problem here, we're really only given the KSP. So again, if you're only given the KSP, you should pretty, pretty much do an ice table. Um, so our, our table is going to be set up with our silver quarry, which is our solid on the reactant side, which it always is solids over there. We have our ions that it breaks apart into. And again, we are given the KSP in this case of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. So because we're really not given anything, uh, we're gonna start with zeros on our product side in terms of our um, initial concentrations. Again, I'm not gonna be concerned at all about the solid as obviously it's not going to play an effect on the equilibrium. Here again, we're going to do plus S and plus S. Again, that S represents the molar solubility. And, you know, we do assume in pretty much most cases that it is heading obviously in this direction towards the product side. At equilibrium then, that means that we do end up with S and S at this point. Any questions on the ice table there? So uh, we are going to put this into our KSP expression, which should be our products over our reactants. But much like most of these here, our reactants are solid. So it ends up being just our products. And that would equal the value that was given to us of 1.6 to the minus 10. At this point, like normal, we're going to put our equilibrium line into here. That's going to give us basically S times S is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. That gives us S squared is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And that gives us an S value of taking the square root. One point three to the minus five. And that S again represents the molar solubility, which means that technically that is molarity at that point. Now we don't want it in molarity, we do want it in grams per liter. So we do need to use the molar mass of silver chloride to convert it. So if we start here, that is 1.3 times 10 to the minus five moles per liter of silver chloride. And using the molar mass from the periodic table there, 107.9 plus uh, 3545 gives us something like 143.35. grams per mole of silver chloride. And that would get us something like uh, 1.9 <clears throat> times 10 to the minus three grams per liter. So that basically means that you can dissolve 0 0.0019 grams of silver chloride and 1,000 milliliters of water, basically, our solution. That is not very much, and that is why we consider silver chloride to be pretty much insoluble, right? Because not even 0.1 of a gram you could get to dissolve, or you could dissolve, you can only dissolve about 0.00 two grams basically in every thousand milliliters say of water and again that's obviously why it's considered to be pretty much insoluble but even something that's insoluble like silver chloride which we've all probably seen those white solids have form you know technically speaking if you go out far enough there is a degree of solubility even of something like that any questions on that calculation there <clears throat> Now you may be wondering how I made the leap perhaps from solving for S to 
like that's the solubility of the entire thing here, which is essentially what we're talking about. So how I did that is typically speaking, when you do solve for S, it is the molar solubility of, as you can see here in this particular example, the silver ions it is also the molar solubility of the chloride ions. And if you think about stoichiometry going backwards, it's a one to one relationship there, which means technically speaking, this would also be the same value for S. And same thing here, one to one coming back would be the, the same value for S. So typically speaking, when you solve for S, uh, that is the molar solubility of the whole thing, basically. Even in uh, this guy, for example, you know, if we look at the table, when we did solve for S, um, you know, we would, if we put S into here, right? and whatever we got, we'll just say four, for example. And when we did solve for S and we did get the four, if we then wanted to relate it back to this guy, we would divide by three and it would get us back to our original number anyways. So even in a situation where it's like three S, um, you know, when you do solve for S, it actually still is this guy's concentration because technically speaking, you would multiply that number by three in this example, but then has to divide it by three going back to our original guy as well. So the threes cancel and ultimately S is that number. The difference would be though, if you wanted the equilibrium solubility of silver ions in this example, you would have to multiply it by a three and that would be your number. Um, but relating it back to the whole thing, it really does end up always being the same number as S when you solve for it. Any questions on any of that there? Okay, why don't you try this one here. Calculate the concentration of aluminum in a saturated solution of aluminum hydroxide. The KSP of aluminum hydroxide is two times 10 to the minus 32. So see what you come up with and we'll talk about
Okay, so let's take a look at this one. So in this case, again, we're just given the KSP. Uh, so we do want to uh, pretty much do an ice table. So we're going to uh, start with breaking this guy apart correctly. So we have some aluminum hydroxide going to get us an aluminum ion plus three hydroxides here. Our uh, KSP in this case would be the concentration of aluminum times the concentration of hydroxide. And we do need to cube it because of the three. Uh, and again, that would equal R2 times 10 to the minus 32 in this case. So doing our ice table here, like we did before, again, we're gonna ignore the solid on our reactant side. We're gonna go zeros. We're going to have a change, which is gonna be plus S and plus three S, again, because of the coefficient that we got going on there. That is going to bring us down to S and three S. Any questions on the ice table? So uh, since we're only given the KSP, uh, we're going to put that into our KSP expression. So that would give us S times 3S cubed equals R2 times 10 to the minus 32. Again, you don't want to forget the cubing part as well for that. And it's very, very common. People go, I did the three already. I got to cube it again. And it's something that's very commonly missed. Now, when we do this, this will get you 27 S to the fourth is equal to two times 10 to the minus 32. In addition to also things that are commonly missed is this part. People oftentimes will cube the S but forget all about the three. So you wanna make sure that you also cube the three as well. We wanna uh, divide two to the minus 32 divided by 27. That's gonna give us S to the fourth is equal to 7.41 times 10 to the minus 34. We're gonna take the fourth root of that. And if we do that, we will end up with a number of 5.2 to the minus nine. On your calculator, you may end up with a bunch of zeros and a five at the end, as you may run out of room. So if you put in scientific notation, that's how I get to the 5.2. Um, also, uh, in case uh, you don't know how to punch this in correctly, again, this is basically the fourth root, right, of this. On a lot of people's calculators, uh, you do have uh, perhaps a actual root type button. You could use that one. Um, if not, you could take our number, which was uh, 7.41 times 10 to the minus 34, and you could take it to the one divided by four, and that will do the cube root. So use like your caret button and do one divided by four is the fourth root or one divided by two is the square root. One divided by three would be the cube root. Um, so that's again, another way that you can sort of do it on your calculator if you're not sure how to do it. So a lot of calculators do have this sort of button where you punch the number in first and then that square root. Um, but if not, a very simple way of doing it is on a lot of calculators like the caret type button or you, know, you may even have a button that looks like this. And again, one divided by whatever you need the root to be. So fourth root four, one divided by five, fifth root, whatever it may be. Any questions on that part of it there? <clears throat> okay. So uh, when we do get S here, now a couple of things here, we were interested in the aluminum concentration at equilibrium. So this here would be the aluminum concentration which is equal to S, so it is 5.2 times 10 to the minus nine molar. And if we were doing sig figs correctly, since we only had one here, 
I guess it would be down to five. I will leave it about if you want to do it right. Um, and this would then be 3S if we were interested in the hydroxide concentration. And we would get a hydroxide concentration of, we'll call it 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8 molar. And again, sig fig wise, probably should be one on each of them. So 5 to the minus 9 or 2 to the minus 8 would be the concentrations. Any questions on that? So this is sort of what I was talking about earlier, like how we could relate it back to this. So for example, if we looked at uh, the hydroxide concentration at equilibrium is 1.6 to the minus eight. If you, uh, So if we wanted to relate, say, the hydroxide concentration back to the whole thing, we would have our 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8 moles per liter of hydroxide. And then we could do a little stoichiometry, and it is a 3 to 1 relationship. So for every 3 moles of OH minus, we get 1 mole of the whole thing. And that then would make you divide your 1.6 to the minus eight divided by three, and you're back to your basically five times 10 to the minus nine molar for your whole thing, which is the value of S basically, yeah. So as you can see, if you kind of go backwards based on stoichiometry, S always ends up being the molar solubility of the whole thing as well. Question on that. Okay, so these are two sort of common sort of approaches to these type of problems. Either you're trying to figure out the solubility of something or you are trying to figure out the KSP. And again, in one case, when you're given just the KSP, you do definitely have to do an ice table in the second case, you don't necessarily have to do an ice table, but I might recommend it because, again, it, it sort of helps you put everything together correctly and not miss anything in the calculation, like an, a three or a two that you should multiply or, to, or uh, take it to the exponent. Any questions on that part of it? So this is just some different sort of uh, relationships mathematically of what you get between KSP and S and what you have to do. Uh, again, if you just kind of go through the ice table, you'll end up with the same sort of solution. So can we use KSP values that we find on the table that help us decide, you know, what would be more soluble, what would be maybe less soluble in a situation if we had a couple of different salts maybe involved? And the answer is yes and no. So when we do have a substance and we're trying to compare it to another substance and they both produce the exact same number of ions, not the exact same type of ions, but the exact same total number of ions, mathematically speaking, you then can go to the KSP table and figure out which one would be more soluble and which one would be less soluble based on that. So when we look at something like these three guys here and we want to compare the solubilities of silver iodide, copper one iodide, and calcium sulfate, each one of these, if we took silver iodide and we broke it apart, we get a silver ion and an iodide ion. That is a grand total of two ions produced. If we look at copper one iodide, same thing here, we end up with a copper ion and an iodide ion. And that also is two ions. And even calcium sulfate here. We end up with a calcium ion and a sulfate ion, which is also two ions. 
So because each of these three guys break apart into a grand total of two ions, we can go to the table and just compare the KSP values. So for example, what does that mean? Well, it means the same thing that we talked about when we normally have talked about K. If we have a large value of K, that means when we reach equilibrium, we mainly have products. When we have a small value of K, when we reach equilibrium, that means that we mainly have reactants. So when we're dealing with something that's KSP, that the reaction is always written this way, solid to aqueous ions. If I have a large KSP value, that means I mainly have products. And in the case of KSP, that means products would be aqueous. And if products are aqueous, that means I would expect it to be more soluble than something that has a smaller value of K because a smaller value of K would mean we would mainly have reactants. And in a KSP situation, our reactants are solid and we would expect it to be less soluble. So the larger the KSP value, the more soluble something is. The smaller the KSP value, the less soluble something is. So if we were to look up these values on the table uh, for each of these guys here, we could uh, compare, you know, their values that we see. So for example, uh, maybe I can find it, silver iodide. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, silver iodide is like 1.5 to the minus 16. Minus 16. Copper one iodide. I don't know if I have that one. I don't think I do. Um, on that chart I'm looking at and calcium sulfate. Maybe I got that one at least. Uh, calcium sulfate. Uh, 6.1 to the minus five. <clears throat> So when just comparing those two, the calcium sulfate and the silver iodide, we can see the calcium sulfate is a much larger KSP value, which means it is more soluble. Again, larger value means more products, more ions, versus our silver iodide, which is 1.5 to the minus 16, which is much smaller. And much smaller means more reactants, which is more solid, so less solubility. I'm assuming copper one iodide is somewhere in between those two numbers and it would have a KSP value or a solubility that falls between those two. So there is sort of an exception here. Again, you can look at the KSP values for things that have the same number of ions that are produced. So that also means that if you are trying to compare things that do not produce the same number of ions, you cannot use the KSP value. So you do have to actually do the calculation. So just to show you an example of that, if we look at this table here and we wanted to compare these three guys and try to decide which one is more soluble and which one's least soluble, we would do the same approach. We would break apart copper uh, two sulfide and we would get a copper two ion and a sulfide ion. And that's a grand total of two ions. We'd break apart silver sulfate, sulfide. And we would get two silver ions and a sulfide. That is a total of three ions. And if we break apart our bismuth, We get uh, two bismuths. Let's say three. And two uh, and three sulfides in that particular case. And that's a grand total of five ions. So you may be tempted to go, I'll just go to the table, I'll find the KSP values, and I'll just compare them. And if you did that, Based on the KSP values, the copper two sulfide actually has the larger value. And this guy is the smaller value, which means in terms of solubility, we would expect this guy to be more soluble. 
and this guy to be the least soluble. And what we actually see when we do the calculation is the reverse. We actually see that when you do the calculation, the bismuth there is actually the most soluble and the copper two sulfide is actually the least soluble. So because these guys do not break apart into the same number of ions, you cannot use the KSP values to determine it. You actually do have to do a calculation, some type of calculation like we've been doing to figure out the solubility of each of these guys, and then you should compare them. So. You can use KSP values to a limited extent. The limited extent is you can do it when you're comparing things that break apart into the same number of ions. If they do not break apart into the same number of ions, then you cannot use the KSP value. You actually have to do the calculation and figure out um, what the solubility of each of those guys are and then compare them. Question on that there. <clears throat> so now that we've talked a little bit about solubility, how to calculate solubility of things, we're going to talk about some things that affect solubility. So we're going to talk about things that uh, can affect the solubility of things. And again, based on solubility rules, sometimes people have the, I'll say, wrong impression about solubility rules. Solubility rules are really rules that for the most part in most situations, sort of ideal situations, that is what you would expect it to happen. Uh, so for example, you would expect when you put together silver and chloride that you do get a solid. But there's a lot of things that could potentially affect whether or not when you put those together, if you would actually see the solid form or not. So we're gonna now talk about some things that you know do have a pretty good effect on solubility and some things that could either affect you seeing a solid being formed or affect you not seeing the solid being formed. You know, you, these are things that can really affect it. So the first thing that can kind of affect solubility is the common ion effect. So we talked about common ion effect when we talked about buffers in the previous chapter. And if you remember in the previous chapter, we saw that the common ion effect will basically decrease the acid or base from breaking apart. And the same idea happens here. When we have a common ion that's present, it has an effect on the solubility. So why would that be? Again, you could just think about it in the simplest form that these guys have solid on the reactant side, aqueous ions on the product side, so in order to have a common ion, that would mean that you would be adding some more product. And because you're adding more product, what that means is Le Chatelier's principle would tell us it will shift to the left. And when it shifts to the left, that is keeping it together as a solid. So that is why it will, uh, that is why it will basically decrease the solubility <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Okay. So by having those ions that are present, it's going to push the equilibrium back to the reactant side, and it's going to cause the uh, solubility of that to basically decrease because it's going to stay together. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Okay, so let's take a look at this. Um, what is the molar solubility of silver bromide in water and also sodium bromide? So let's take a look first at uh, just the pure water. So if we look at silver bromide in pure water, we want to figure out what is the solubility of it in pure water. So if we went to the table, we could find that the KSP value for silver bromide is 7.7 .7 to the minus 13. 
So if we were to figure out just the molar solubility here, we would do an ice table since we only have the KSP given to us. So that would give us silver bromide, making our silver plus our bromide. We're going to do our zero, zero. Change would be plus S plus S like we did before. That is gonna give us S and S. Our KSP here would be our silver ion times our bromide ion, which is essentially S squared, would give us 7.7 uh, .7 times 10 to the minus 13, giving us an S of, what do we got there? Square root of that would be, Eight point eight times ten to the minus seven molar would be our molar solubility of silver bromide, basically in water. <clears throat> Any questions on that calculation? So that's exactly similar to what we did in the earlier calculation. So what happens when we put our silver bromide, not in water, but into 0 0.001 sodium bromide. So when we do that, sodium bromide is going to break apart into sodium ions and bromide ions. And if we look at our original setup here, the common ion in this case is going to be our bromide. So we know the concentration of our bromide in this case would be 0 0.001 because it's a one to one relationship between those two things. So what that affects in our ice table is the initial part. We do have zero for our silver, but in this case, we actually do have a value for our bromide coming from the sodium bromide that's present. The rest of the ice table will be similar, plus S, plus S, which means at equilibrium, we have S 0 0.001 plus S. This is going to go into our equilibrium expression, just like we did on the other side. Let's give us somewhere to scribble here. So putting this into our KSP, it would give us S times 0 0.001 plus S is equal to 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 13. Now this KSP is a small value of K. So like we've done before, we might as well give it an assumption there and assume that in this case, S is equal to zero just like we made an assumption of X is equal to zero. And just like when we do that, it is only the S that's going to be added to something. So that will give us S times 0 0.001 equals 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 13. We're going to take 7.7 .7 to the minus 13. We're going to divide it by 0 0.001. Going to give us an S of 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 10 molar. Any questions on that calculation? You could check it like we've done before. You could take this S value divided by 0 0.001 times it by 100 and you'll find that the check is good. And in most cases, because this is so small, it's going to probably be good your, your assumption. So what we can see if we sort of compare it is our S value here is 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 10 molar when we have that common ion present. And <clears throat> in comparison to it in water, we see that the solubility of silver bromide in water is much higher, it is to the minus seven. So when you're comparing, as we talked about before, minus seven to minus 10, 
minus seven is a larger number. So it's much more soluble in water than it is in this common ion. And that's really based on Le Chatelier's principle because with that common ion there, it is sending the equilibrium back to the left-hand side. Again, keeping it together more than it would in this situation here where there is no common ion present. So that presence of a common ion will restrict basically the salt from breaking apart and it will keep it together, thus decreasing the solubility when the common ion is present. Any questions on that there? So why don't you give one a go here and see what you come up with. So here's a silver chromate. Uh, what would be the solubility of this compound in 0.1 molar potassium chromate? KSP is given to you, so see what you come up with, and then we'll talk about it.
Okay, so let's take a look here. So here we have our uh, silver chromate, and we have the KSP given to us, and it's in potassium chromate. So again, the one with the KSP, which is our silver chromate, is going to set up that equilibrium. So that's sort of where we might want to start. Again, when this breaks apart, we do get a couple of silvers, and we get a chromate with a minus two charge. And potassium chromate is uh, K2CRO4. So when that breaks apart, hold on the other side of it, we get two potassiums and a chromate over here. Obviously our chromate here is our common ion that we're going to see here. And when we want the concentration of just a chromate, it is a one to one relationship. So the concentration of the chromate here would be 0.1. The potassium would be two times 0.1, but we don't really need it here. And what that's going to affect again is when we get into our ice table, we are going to have zero here for our silver, but we are going to have an opening concentration of chromate that's being provided by potassium chromate. Rest of the table here is going to be very similar to what we've done before, plus 2s. Again, we don't want to forget about the 2. And plus s as well, going to get to our equilibrium, which is 2s and 0 0.1 plus s. Any questions on the ice table up to that point? So like normal, we're going to put this into our KSP expression, and that is going to be our silver ion that's going to be squared, again, also for the two that's here, and going to be our chromate, and that will equal our 9 times 10 to the minus 12. Putting in our numbers, uh, we do get uh, 2s, and again, squared, times 0 0.1 plus s equals 9 uh, times 10 to the minus 12. Again, at this point, we can assume that S is equal to zero because of our small value of K. And that reduces us down really to 4S squared times 0 0.1 equals 9 times 10 to the minus 12. Uh, we're going to basically divide to the other side by 0.4. And the reason it's 0.4 is because it's 4 times 0.1 gives us 0.4 on the left-hand side. So 9 to the minus 12 divided by 0.4. And then uh, that gives us S squared is equal to 2.25 times 10 to the minus 11. We want to square root it. So a little square root action. And that gives us a grand total here of 4.7 to the minus 6 uh, would be the solubility of our silver chromate in a solution that already contains chromate in there. Again, it's going to cause that equilibrium because of this initial concentration to shift to the left and thus keep it together and lower the solubility of it. Question on that calculation, our common ion effect. Okay. Questions on anything we talked about here today, I think we will stop there at this point. Okay, a couple of things then. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a quiz today on chapter 14, uh, the beginning part there up through buffers, I think it was. And uh, it will open at 1130 around the start of lab. You should take it around 1130 to start it. Uh, you'll be given some conversions. Again, I don't think I'll give you a periodic table because I don't think you need it for anything. Uh, there are some problems where you do have to show the work. So obviously you need to upload the work immediately after you submit the quiz using proctorial and obviously the module like normal, there'll be an announcement that will come out um, when the quiz opens. 
So what we'll do is, so since quiz, we'll start, we'll start lab at one o'clock. So we'll start what lab at 1 p.m. That should give everybody enough time, obviously, to take the quiz, complete the quiz. And at 1 p.m., we will uh, have lab and we'll talk about the buffer experiment that we're starting uh, today. So that also give everybody probably a little bit of a break after the quiz. Uh, so we'll pick back up at about one o'clock uh, through the lab lecture like normal. If you do have any questions on the quiz, feel free to email me. But again, I, I think it should be pretty self-explanatory. Um, but if you do, you can always email me if you have any questions. Any questions on any of that stuff? Okay. So uh, good luck on your quiz. Again, an announcement will come out. It should open around 1130-ish. Again, uh, you'll have maybe about 35 minutes to take it or so. And then uh, make sure you upload it as well. And uh, <clears throat> then we will uh, start lab at 1. Okay. I'll see everybody about 1 o'clock.